Hello, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with this webinar. First of all, I'd like to welcome everybody to this webinar. We will be talking about demand modes and which are correct. Um, does it really matter what this demand mode means for you? First of all, if you have any questions, there is a questions tab on your panel. Feel free to um, write in that. I usually save all of the questions to the end. We can go back in the slides if we need to. So feel free to ask questions, and if I don't get to them during the presentation, I'll make time for them at the end. My name is Lauren Stewart. I'm a CFSE. I work here at Exeter with primarily our mechanical customers. I do safety cases and FMEDAs, um, audits and evaluations of products, but I also work with the end user side as well. Um, I also do research here. I've researched failure rates and stiction and 2H. If you're not familiar with Exeter, we are a company that's global. We have offices many in different places in the world and I like to say no matter where you are or your customers are, we have someone close by that can help you with all of your functional safety needs, whether that's um, functional safety in the process industry or alarm management or cybersecurity. Exeter is involved with the complete supply chain of functional safety in multiple industry sectors. We started or we work with um, original equipment manufacturers or OEMs who product needs certification and FAMITAs the whole way through to end users that use that product and how to implement that product safely. Um, we also provide software tools and training and consulting so anything that's related to functional safety, whether it's the process industry, automotive, nuclear, end users, engineering contractors, system designers, we have something for all of you. For our engineering and consulting services, we have our functional safety or process safety sector. We have our alarm management and our cybersecurity. We have different engineering tools and programs that will save you time and money while we are able to increase efficiency and productivity and doing so will help, your, um, help you grow in whichever industry you are in. So whether you're performing PHAs or LOPAs, SIL selection, SIL verification, SRS, proof test procedures, um, cyber risk assessment, alarm rationalization, any of that, we have um, software and tools to make your life easier. With Exeta certification, we have certification in IEC 61508 and 511, 26262 and tool qualification. We have ISA Secure. Um, machine safety, and we also have personnel certification programs. So anything with functional safety, we have some type of certification um, that can help you prove that you are um, an expert in functional safety. But today, you came to hear about demand mode, so let's go ahead and get into it. We're talking about demand modes and what you're currently running. Is it correct? Does this demand mode really matter and why do we really care? We're going to look at um, definitions of high, low, and continu continuous demand rates. We're going to look at some examples of each demand mode and how it affects your system. We're going to get into a little bit into proof testing and how proof testing can influence your demand mode and the differences between probability of failure on demand and the average versus the probability of failures per hour calculations. 
to be able to correctly define a demand mode in terms of functional safety, we first have to understand what we're including in the safety function along with what really is a safety function. So a safety function is a collection of equipment. You're going to have your sensors, your logic solvers, any final elements together to implement the automatic mitigation of one particular hazard. So the actual implementation of any single safety instrumented function may include multiple sensing elements or signaling conditions. Um, you could have your um, modules, multiple final elements such as valves and actuators and solenoids together with a dedicated circuit utility like an electrical power or instrumented air. We normally don't include or model failure rates such as of cables and terminal boxes that are in the safety function. However, when you're designing a safety function, you still need to um, properly, um, properly look over what the environments it's going to be used in, how they're electrically rated, how they're designed and tested so that they're going to be appropriate for your application. But we're not going to include it in failure rates of the safety function. And depending on the design decisions, such as if the valve and actuator or solenoid are de-energized to trip or energized to trip, the failure rates of the safety function may also include power supports, power supplies or UPSs, anything like that will be included in the safety function. So here is an example of what a safety function looks like. Um, everything on the outside in that peach color are portions of the safety function. To the right, you're going to have some type of sensors. In the middle, you're going to have some type of logic solver. And in the end, you're going to have your final elements. Um, and all of those pieces together are going to be your safety function we're not including the anything in the control process in the safety function. So the safety function is just if something in this control process goes wrong, how to automatically mitigate the situation, how to shut it down in a safe manner. There are different modes of operation in, for your safety function and they are defined in the different standards um, starting with IEC 61508, there's three different modes of operation. You have your continuous demand mode, your high demand mode, and your low demand mode. In the middle, you can see IEC 61511 only has two modes of operation. Continuous mode, which covers both continuous and high demand mode operations. And then their low demand mode is just considered demand mode. This was highly confusing to multiple people, which I can completely understand. When you're using different terms to say the same definition or different definitions for the same term, it can be hard to keep track of everything. So the second edition of IEC 61511, which parts are released and parts aren't, um, it's the 2016 edition, it's going to have the same definitions as IEC 61508. So they're going to mirror each other. We're going to have continuous demand in both standards. We're going to have high demand in both standards and low demand in both standards. So they're going to complement each other instead of making more confusion to the subject. So what do these demand modes mean? Well, here at Exeta, we have um, our definition of what low demand and high and continuous demand mode means. For a low demand 
system, we're going to say the average interval between a dangerous condition or a demand interval occurs infrequently. Say you have a safety system set up and there's only one demand per year. The automatic diagnostic testing interval is an order of magnitude lower than the demand interval. And the demand interval is greater than two times the manual proof test interval. So therefore, automatic diagnostics and proof testing can be given credit for risk reduction because it is an order of magnitude lower and the demand interval is greater than two times the manual proof test interval. Whereas high or continuous demand mode is a demand interval is less than twice the proof test interval. We're going to look at some examples of these and what they look like graphically. So um, I can understand that still this is a little confusing. Um, when the demand to activate a safety function are frequent compared to the test interval of the SIF, it's going to be considered high demand. Um, other sectors define and separate high demand and continuous demand mode based on whether diagnostics can reduce the accident rate, but in either case the continuous mode is where the frequency of the unwanted accident or the demand is essentially determined by the frequency of dangerous failures on the safety function. When the safety function fails, the demand for its action will occur in a much shorter time frame than the functional testing is happening. So speaking of its failure probability is not necessarily meaningful. Essentially all the dangerous faults in the safety function in a continuous mode service will be revealed by the process having a demand instead of a test or a functional test or a proof test. Where low demand mode, you're going to find possible um, dangerous failures through proof testing and functional testing. So we're going to look at a few examples um, just to kind of get your mind in the right set for low demand or high and continuous demand. For example, we're going to have car brake. So what if you are using your car brake? You use that quite often, hopefully, um, anytime you want to slow down or stop. If you're driving your car once a day or more, chances are you're going to be using your brakes more often. Um, what happens if you press the brake and it doesn't brake? It just keeps going. You're going to have a demand on the system and the system is not running correctly. So in this example, a car brake failure would be something in a high or a continuous demand mode of operation. What if you're looking at an emergency shutdown valve? Um, it's something that's going to shut down the process. Hopefully, when you're doing your process, you're not going to have a demand shutting down your process very often. What if it happens a demand once a year or even twice a year? If your proof test interval is less than twice that, this is going to be continued considered a low demand mode of operation. What about a sprinkler system in a plant or a facility? Hopefully you're not using your sprinkler system often. Hopefully you're not getting drenched every day or even every month. So a sprinkler system would be an example of another low demand mode of operation. But what if you have something with robotics. What if this robot is doing something in your plant and helping build something? Well, this robot would be considered a continuous demand mode of operation. It is not just sitting there waiting to be used um, in a robot application. You're going to probably find that there's an error when 
an accident happens, not when you're doing proof tests. With those examples in mind, these are the things that can affect, um, be affected by your different mode of operation. Taking the IEC 61508 or the future IEC 61511 definitions, we can define the demand modes in low demand, high demand, or continuous demand. In a low demand application, you're going to use the probability of failure on demands, the averages tables. Um, you're going to be able to take credit for proof testing because it's less than two times your demand rate. And you can also take credit for automatic diagnostics. In high demand mode of application, instead of using the average probability of failure on demand tables, you're going to use the probability of failures per hour table. We'll take a look at the difference between those tables coming up. Um, you're not going to be able to take credit for proof testing because your proof testing isn't happening often enough compared to your demand rate. But you still are able to take credit for your automatic diagnostics. Whereas in a continuous demand mode of operation, once again, you're going to use the probability of failures per hour table and not the average probability of failure on demand table. You're going to not be able to take credit for proof testing again. Your proof tests aren't happening as often as they need to for your demand rate and you're not going to be able to take credit for automatic diagnostics. So keeping that in mind, the some differences in the mode of operation, we're going to go through and explain what those differences actually mean to a plant or to a device. Taking what you now know about low demand mode of operation, we can go to the tables and look from IEC 61508. Um, this is from the normative part one section of the standards. And this shows that for a low demand mode of operation, you're going to have your different safety integrity levels depending on the different average probability of failure on demand calculations that you have done. So you can do the probability of failure on demand calculation and find your safety integrity level that um, you're going to be achieving. And this is different for low demand or high demand mode application. Um, the calculations for the probability of failure on demand are also different. So your the differences will come to play when you are looking at your PFD or PFH and your sill levels, depending on if you're low demand or high or continuous demand mode of operation. So having different demand modes can change your PFD, can change your safety integrity level. And those are two big things that when you're doing um, plant design or when you're calculating what your plant is actually having or when to do proof tests, those can make a big difference if you are considered low demand or high demand. Let's take, for example, um, we're going to look at SIL 3 safety integrity level. Your probability of failure on demand is going to be between some number 10 to the negative 4 or 10 to the negative 3 to 10 to the negative 4, depending um, on what your calculation is. But if you look at the high demand mode of operation for the same safety integrity level, instead of being 10 to the negative 3 to 10 to the negative 4, you have 10 to the negative 7 to 10 to the negative 8. And these are the probability of dangerous failures per hour. So this is for high demand or continuous demand mode of operations. So this can be quite, make a difference in your SIL levels. So having the correct demand mode is pretty important.
to figure out your probability of failure, we use something called um, the probability of failure approximation or the probability of failure on demand average. And this is for a single failure mode. And we're going to look at the approximation. Um, these are simplified calculations that the standard gives us. And your probabil average probability of failure on demand takes in consideration your um, proof test interval and your dangerous failure rates. And if you do the expanded probability of failure on demand calculation, you're going to find that you have nine key variables in this calculation itself. Um, the one we're going to take a look at today is um, proof test intervals and proof test effectiveness and how they can change your probability of failure on demand as well as your safety integrity level. And this is all being affected by if you have low demand versus high demand or continuous demand mode of operation. To understand a proof test, um, there are two different, different definitions. You have your definition from IEC 61508 and the Exeter definition of proof tests. We felt that the IEC 61508 was um, a little um, gray area. It wasn't exactly, um, didn't have all of the points that we wanted to make for a proof test. But IEC 61508 defines a manual proof test to perform to de detect dangerous hidden failures in a safety related system. So if necessary, a repair can be can restore the system to as new condition or as close as practical to that as new condition as possible. The perf Exida thinks the purpose of the proof test is to detect any failures not detected by automatic online diagnostics. So these are dangerous failures, um, diagnostic failures, parametric failures, and to detect unauthorized program changes. So proof testing is a very important part of the management of safety functions. And as an activity that's required by the standards, more and more end users are implementing proof tests. But there is often confusion on what should be included and what the coverage should be claimed. Um, so we're going to look at what needs to be considered in a proof test design first. When you're designing your proof test, you not only have to look at the performance requirements, but also the functional requirements. You want to look at what does the safety function need to do um, for the functional requirements, but also performance requirements, such as is there a certain amount of leakage that's acceptable, or is this a tight shutoff application? Are there timing requirements to close the valve or not? Um, what if you have a safety function that says the final element must close um, to class 3 leakage within 180 seconds. So that says what leakage is allowed and the timing requirements for this safety function. And you're also going to look at the safety manuals, whether there's any exceptions to the rules, and that will always be stated in the functional safety manual. I'm a very visual person, so this idea of proof tests and everything and the test interval, um, just with words, is still a little murky with me. So I made it visual. So as you, the bottom, you're going to have it, some interval of time. And as the time increases, your probability of failure is going to increase. And this is going to do so until you do a proof test. At that point of proof test, you know there's no dangerous failures, so it goes back down to zero. That time is going to be considered your proof test interval. 
So that time in between starting your safety function and doing a proof test is your proof test interval. And this is going to com continue for as many proof test intervals you're going to have for your useful life. And that's what this is going to look like. It's going to continue. And if you have a perfect proof test, it's going to go right back down to a probability of absolutely zero. But as you might know, um, nothing in life is ever perfect. Um, I'm certainly not perfect. The Everything I do is absolutely not perfect as much as we try to be perfect. Um, so what happens um, if you do a perfect proof test it's going to go back down to zero. We're going to look at what happens if your proof test is not perfect in a couple of slides. When you are doing simplified equations, like we saw from the standard, you're going to have some probability of failure that you want to calculate. And if you'd like really like math, you can go ahead and do all of the integrals and figure out this probability from the long calculations, or you can use the simplified calculations that the standard said you can use. This is going to figure out your average probability of failure. And that is calculated with the simplified equations. So the average probability of failure is the calculated red line. So half of the time you're going to be below this PFD average, but as the time continues it's going to be above the average probability of failure on demand. But when you're looking at the average probability of failure on demand and your test interval, like we talked about, is the proof test perfect? Has everything been tested? Say if I run a functional test and see the system respond, then that means everything that we need to work is done, right? It, it worked. We proved it worked. It's perfect. It's zero. So what's the problem? It seems like everybody, every, the test is perfect. There's no demand mode. So um, there's no failure on demand, you made sure everything works, so it should go back to zero, right? Everything's tested. Um, well, let's say you have a proof test and you're doing it on a pressure sensor and it's isolated in the pump such that the sensor pressure exceeds the trip point. The remote actuated valve is to observed to verify that it moves, so everything's tested. Well, what if that valve seat isn't sealing properly. You could have leakage. Well, what if the response time, did you measure the response time? Did it match what you need the response time to be? Did you look at the safety manual? Um, there could be a component failure that be caused the speed of the response to exceed the process safety time. What about the process connections to the sensor might be failed, or the power supply droops, or the wire resistant may be limiting the maximum current, and that could disable diagnostic alarms. So there's many things that, even though you saw the valve move, there could be many things that you didn't necessarily test and find. And while we all strive to be perfect, even with proof tests to detect every single dangerous failure, it's rarely achieved. Um, once again, another example, I like examples, sorry if you get bored with them, but a safety function uses this butterfly valve and a pneumatic single action actuator to implement a close to trip function. So if a demand happens on the system, this butterfly valve is going to close, shutting off the process. A full stroke test of an actuator valve assembly is done. So are there any potential undetected dangerous failures? 
well, yeah. Did you check the seals? They could be damaged. That could be, even though the butterfly is shut, if the seals are damaged, you could still have leakage through the valve. What if the um, butterfly or the disc or the ball is damaged and it's not sealing correctly? What if there's a damaged shaft and you think that the actuator did a full stroke, so that means that the butterfly has closed, but what if the shaft is disconnected from the actuator or broken somehow? The actuator is telling you to close the valve, but it's no longer connected, so the valve stays open. There are many things that could happen that are imperfect proof testing. And there are ways to um, make your proof testing better. There are different levels of proof testing that are defined. And if you want more information to make your proof test better, we have webinars and white papers and blogs about that. So please visit our, web, our website and see um, the different types of proof testing that can make your proof testing better, whether it's um, doing your full stroke test with leak detection online or offline. Um, there's different ways this can be done. But once again, visually, what does this look like? Well, you're going to have your probability of failure increase as time goes on then once you have that proof test, instead of going back down to absolutely zero, you're going to go down whatever level your proof test effectiveness or your coverage is. This coverage is going to be a zero to 100% um, number, and you're going to hopefully have a high proof test effectiveness, but what if it's only 60%? What if you're not doing leak testing and you still need a tight shutoff? What if your proof test effectiveness is 80%? You're going to go ahead and drop down that percentage during your proof test interval. And this might not be a big deal, for your probability of failure on demand calculation if you're just doing one proof test interval for your mission time or your useful life. But as you increase your mission time, as you have many proof test intervals in one mission time, your probability of failure on demand is going to increase um, time and time again. So the first time, maybe your probability of your failure on demand is here. But the next time, your probability of failure on demand is going to be up there. And so on and so on. So this is going to increase your probability of failure on demand over the mission time. So why do you really care about this? Well, in your calculation, say you calculated your average probability of failure on demand, and during this time, you're going to say, wow, I'm a SIL-3. This is awesome. Um, I can use this process, use the um, imperfect proof test, and be a SIL-3. But as time goes on, what if that SIL-3 level was just on the edge? So the next probability of failure on demand, um, your proof test interval 2 and 3, you might only be a SIL-2. So in your head, you're operating at a SIL-3 capable, um, uh, your safety function is a SIL-3, but in reality, you might only be a SIL-2 operation. But what happens if this continues and continues and continues to the point that you're operating at a SIL-1 condition? And obviously this is an extreme example, but this is what can actually happen. So having your proof test interval affect your PFD average, affect your SIL level, which is affected by if you have a low demand mode operation or a higher continuous demand mode operation. But what happens if 
your demand is happening more frequently. What happens if your proof test interval, say, is six months, but you had a demand at month two and month five? Well, that's kind of rendering your proof test useless. You're having demands more often than the proof test is happening. And again, and again. So when you're having frequent demands, the demand is likely to happen before the proof test can happen. So you cannot take credit for your proof testing in a non-redundant system. You can't say that your proof test is going to find this demand when the demand is happening more often than the proof test is happening. So usually when people think of high or continuous demand mode operations, they think of a machinery making parts or some type of robot that's considered high or continuous demand mode of operation. But in reality, it's any process that a demand is likely before the scheduled proof test. So this could be in your process industry, um, depending on your proof test intervals. Now to look back on these tables from IEC 61508 and 511, um, that demand mode for continuous demand application, as we talked about before, um, targets the demands per hour if it's a high demand mode of operation. And these demands per hour or the probability of failure per hour is used. And the different calculations for PFD and PFH, um, you, we've seen the probability of failure on demand calculations. Well, the probability of failures per hour depends if your automatic diagnostics are considered effective or not. If they're going to be able to find um, the dangerous detected failures before the demand is supposed to happen. So if your automatic diagnostics are effective, your probability of failure per hour dangerous are going to be your failure rates of dangerous undetected failures. But if your di automatic diagnostics are not deemed effective, if they aren't happening um, fast enough, your probability of failures per hour are actually going to be your full dangerous failure rate. It's going to be your dangerous detected and your dangerous undetected failures added together because your automatic diagnostics, the ones detecting the dangerous failures, are no longer affected. So you're going to have to include both your dangerous undetected and your dangerous detected failure rates in your probability of failure per hour. So the differences here are if your automatic diagnostics are affected or not. And once again, your proof test intervals are not being taken into consideration because your proof tests are not fast enough. So in summary, we looked at what a low demand, high demand, and continuous demand um, mode of operation are. We looked at some examples of each. We looked at how proof testing um, is affected by your PFD, your PFH, um, and your mission time and proof test um, effectiveness, how that affects your um, SIL level and how those can change um, and the tables from the standard. We also looked at your probability of failure on demand, your average when it's a um, low demand mode of operation or you have many um, proof tests or at least two times the proof test per demand compared to your probability of failures per hour calculations where either your automatic diagnostics are affected or they aren't effective. 
So um, a little bit, I'm going to go ahead and take some questions now. If you have questions later on, email me. I will get to them as soon as I possibly can. Um, we're quite busy right now, so hopefully I'll be able to get to them very soon. Um, for more information about this or other functional safety related topics, please visit our website. We have our reference materials and our books, our white papers, our webinars, our blogs, all the research we do, we want to make it public. We want you to be as safe as you possibly can. As you know, the webinars, um, you'll if you sign up, you'll receive the slides. Um, we have recordings of the webinars on our website and our YouTube channel and those are all free along with our blogs. We try to give free information out in functional safety as often as we can. Um, if you have any good ideas for webinars or blogs or questions please email academy at Exida and you can um, we have Twitter, LinkedIn, all of those social media um, aspects. So now I'm going to go ahead and take some questions. Okay, the first question we have is, can you use a sensor or final control device that is approved for low demand in a high demand SIF? Um, you're going to have to um, see if in the safety manual, if it's going to be appropriate, if it's going to be sized correctly. Um, some sensors and final elements are able to do both but your failure rates are going to be different. And those failure rates for um, low demand or a static application compared to a high demand um, application are going to be different. When you have low demand modes of operation, your device is going to have failures that a high demand mode of operation might not such there could be corrosion or stiction there can be cold welding things that happen to the device that don't that happen because it stays still for so long that won't happen when you're moving it very often so you might be able to use them but make sure that you are using the correct failure rates in your calculations Um, we have a question on proof testing and if it can be performed by a device or it must be performed by the entire SIF. It depends on what you're checking and what level of proof tests you are doing. Um, it can be performed by a device or it can be performed by an entire SIF and your proof test effectiveness is going to be different per the different types of proof testing that you're doing. Um, we have a question about what stage the demand mode is established. Um, that's kind of a tricky question. When we are doing certification for a product, we look if it's going to be in a static or dynamic mode of operation. So it can be um, defined by the manufacturer or it can be something that can be either low demand or high demand mode of operation, but it's going to have different failure rates. So make sure you use the correct failure rates in the different demand modes. Um, Also, does the operator or the end user establish the demand rate? Um, yes, it's going to be um, considered by the process and it's going to be 
considered by many calculations that are done by end users. They're going to um, see how often they expect to be using the demand right, and calculate the proof test interval and everything from that. Um, that is a that question alone is a whole nother webinar. We have um, we have webinars that are more based on end users and more of their calculations. If you'd like to go to our website and our history of webinars, you might be able to get more information from that. Um, the next question is talking about there is an increasing requirement by operators to conduct proof tests less frequency, frequently, let's say once every five years. Given that demand, most demand rates are perhaps once a year or once every three years, do we use probability of failure in such cases? When you are defining demand rate, and they are conscious that the demand will happen or could happen more frequently than the proof test. In those cases, you are not going to be able to count your proof testing in as a um, layer of protection. Um, you're no longer going to be able to use the proof test in the calculations for probability of failure on demand and with it is less than two times the demand rate you're going to consider it a high demand mode of operation. Um, in those cases I would I understand that you're getting pressure to have um, proof tests say once every five years but if they in their application they are having a demand more often than or possibly more often than the um, proof test I would kind of push back and say this is what your demand rate is if you're testing it the test is probably not going to be very useful Um, we had some questions that we already answered, I believe. And then we had a question, a couple questions that are very specific and we're not going to go ahead and get into the very specific questions on this webinar since it's a more general um, webinar but it, feel free to email me um, these more specific questions and I will be able to get back to you on those. Um, at this point that is all the questions that we have. If you have any um, that you think of later or like I said those more specific questions um, please feel free to email me and thank you for joining us I hope you have a wonderful day